While he was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and his brothers were standing outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. But to the one who had told him this, Jesus replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and mother. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So here we are again talking about peace, this time peace within families. It's a tough one. The other day I was watching television and it happened so fast I didn't get it. I looked for it, I couldn't find it online or we would have seen it here this morning. It was a public service announcement on mental health. It started at Thanksgiving table with a family. They started throwing food at each other and it looked like a joke at first and then they got really nasty with each other and the tagline was, if you have problems in your family, call for help because mental health issues start at home. Now I thought, wow, that's pretty harsh. And then the first person that I saw after Thanksgiving Day and I said, how was your Thanksgiving? Burst out sobbing sat down and said it was horrible. All my family did was scream at each other and I don't know if we'll ever be together again. That's what families happen sometimes at holidays, isn't it? Especially in an election year. Oh my goodness, whenever there's an election year, I hate having dinner with anybody I'm related to because everybody has a different opinion about what the world should be like. Especially as COVID has gone on, it's harder and harder than for people to be together sometimes without fighting. We have the story of Cain and Abel here this morning. As I always say, the, God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, God rested. On the eighth day, Adam and Eve screwed it up royally. On the ninth day, Cain killed Abel. People just couldn't wait to get their hands on God's creation, could they? Could we? It's us we're talking about here. And this passage creates a lot of problems for people who are not believers. Why is that? Think about it a moment. What is it about this particular passage that gives people so much pause? when it comes to believing in God. Adam and Eve were the first people, right? God created them, they had children. Who are these other people who are gonna kill Cain when he goes out into the world? Where'd they come from, right? But here we are and Cain kills his brother Abel. Why does he kill him? It seems like he's jealous because God preferred his brother's gift to his. And we don't know why God preferred that other than I always say God loves a good barbecue because God loves the smell of roasted meat being sacrificed. Some of you might feel the same way about that, but um, Abel is the hunter and Cain is the tiller of the soil, but he offers God what he has, the best of his crops, but God prefers his brother's offering and he's so angry that he cannot contain his anger. But God says to him, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not know well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Seems like almost a test to him, doesn't it? But he is so angry, he kills his brother. And God knows, and the line that sticks with us, am I my brother's keeper? Apparently the answer God says is, yes, you're your brother's keeper. And he's sent away into the world. Tough lessons and we looked at the other stories with the kids this morning how many stories of broken families are there in scripture there are so many as there are broken families in the world today even when we look at the christmas movies look at ebenezer scrooge um, charles dickens knew a lot about human emotions didn't he because why did ebenezer scrooge turn out the way he did because of his father's treatment of him because he had when he was born, his mother died childbirth and his father held it against him and sent him away from the home and he was cut off from his family and it turned him into a bitter old man alone in the world. This is hard for me today because my own family's experienced brokenness. My sister doesn't want to speak to me these days. My mother's in the hospital and we're at odds over what's going to happen. So This is a tough thing to talk about, isn't it? And I'm sure if all of you were up here, you'd have a story you could tell about someone in your family, perhaps now, perhaps in the past, with whom you had a broken relationship. It's very difficult, very painful, hard to handle, isn't it? But if we're called to make peace in the world, if we're called to have peace in our own hearts with ourselves, and then we spread to the people we live with, sometimes the hardest people to deal with are the people you live with. 
because you live with them every day, right? You can get on your nerves faster than somebody who's under the same roof you are all the time. But the keys to getting along with each other or making peace are in this passage that we read this morning, all three of the passages. I was going to pick a different one for the epistle, but Lambert and I were talking we were working on worship, and this is the one he suggested. It does make sense to me because I think it contains the key to the whole situation of peace in the world. It's what I shared with the children. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love you and hate a brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Now we could say, well, that's their fault, right? We could point our finger at the one who's angry at us or that we're angry at and say, you don't love me, so you don't love God. But that points a finger at me. I always say to myself when I'm angry at someone, what is it that I need to give up in my own life? How do I need to pray in my own life? How do I need to ask God to come into my own life? And I remember the words of Dorothy Day, the great Catholic social worker who said, I only love God to the extent that I love the person I hate the most in the world. That always brings me up short because there are people who anger me. Do you ever get angry? Anybody here ever get angry? Can you admit to your own anger sometimes? Maybe you don't want to kill somebody. Maybe you never said that in anger. But I, I know my sister and I used to squabble when we were kids. Every Sunday morning, my mother would put curlers in my hair. Lots of curlers. I had a lot of hair. Every Sunday morning, I would take them out one at a time, bounce it off my sister's face. Why? Because I could. I was her little sister. That was the fun that I had. Don't ever take that as an indication of what you should do. Look at them smiling up here. But I just did it. And she said, quit it, quit it, quit it, quit it, quit it. And then she'd smack me and say, Mom, Robin hit me. Now, that's not the only thing that happened. My sister used to bite herself and show my mother, and my mother would bite me back. I would be too young to explain to her, if you count the teeth, I don't have that many yet. But this is how subtling squabble, isn't it? But if we let it, it'll turn into real brokenness in a family that we need to fight against. And then it becomes something we get angry at others, not just in our family. We get angry at political leaders. We get angry at people we don't know, but then... We get angry at the people who agree with the political leaders we don't agree with. We get angry at others all the time. But if we let that anger become hatred, or if we let that hatred become action, then we're in trouble because then we're in the world that the rest of the world is in without God's guidance. God says to us, if you say you love me, but you hate your brother or sister, then you are a liar. That's a tough word from John, isn't it? You're a liar. If you say you love God, but you hate one of God's children that you can see, you're a liar. And I have to bring myself short on that one all the time. If I'm angry at someone, I have to let it go, which means I have to turn to God and God's power, because I don't always have the power to let go of my own anger, but God will take it from me and bring wholeness and peace to my heart. And we put that with the passage from Matthew about Jesus. His family's outside, his literal family, his mother and his brothers and his sisters are saying, come on, Jesus, come with us, we want to take you home. I didn't put the passage for Mark that's the same story, but it says why. Do you remember why they wanted to take Jesus home? They thought he had lost his mind. Because all these people, he's saying all these things that are getting people so upset they're going to kill him. They want to take him home, partly because they want him to be safe, partly because they're pretty ticked off at him themselves for his own preaching that upset so many people. They want him to come home, and Jesus says, Who is my mother, my brother, and my sisters, but they who do the will of my Father? Now, I've used the passage that we read, the epistle passage, to talk about race issues before and say, How can you hate someone here and claim to love God? And they'll say, Well, those people are not my brothers or sisters. But Jesus says, Anyone who is part of his family is their brother or sister or mother, is their parent, is their family. We're all family together. One of the things we can do here is love each other because there's something called a family of origin and a family of choice. A family of origin is where you were born and you had no choice over that. But this congregation become the family of choice for others. Our friends are our family of choice, aren't they? The people that we turn to who understand us and get us sometimes when our own families don't. We can become that for one another. Before in churches I've served, I've had Thanksgiving dinner on weeks or years that my family had dinner without me. I would just invite anybody to my home who needed a place to come. We could be that for other people in this community, couldn't we? 
those of us who don't have big families to eat with on Thanksgiving Day might come here in the future and share a meal together and invite others because that's how family is formed and community is formed around meeting needs. That's one way we could do it. We could pray for others. We could befriend those who don't have families or who are broken off from their families or who are excluded from their families. We could befriend them as well. We can also just invite others into the fellowship of believers here so they can be with us and love us and know us and feel the support they don't feel anywhere else just by worshiping with us. That's what makes a congregation grow, by sharing the love that we have. One thing we need to be very clear about is the difference between being a foot washer and a doormat. Think about that one for a moment. What does a foot washer and a doormat have in common? What do they have in common? They get your feet clean, don't they? And it's the same as the difference between humility and humiliation. They have the same root, don't they? The same root word for both. But one is one that you take on yourself. That's humility, and humiliation is something you impose on someone else. We can't use passages like this about your family to send people into abusive situations. And so many times I've seen pastors particularly send women to be beaten, sometimes to death by their husbands when they try to leave because they made a vow and they're told you have to obey your husband and you have to put up with whatever he, however he treats you. And that's not what this is saying at all. Sometimes families can be abusive in ways that lead to the destruction of an individual. And I'm not saying go back for that because you're not called to be a doormat. You're called to be a foot washer. Now, we were studying the book Amish Grace when the pandemic hit. We had a bunch of people downstairs studying, and then suddenly the study was over because the pandemic hit in March of 2020. But I don't know if any of you finished the book, but it's an interesting book on what forgiveness looks like, even in a community of believers. Because they say in the book that Amish folks, you know, they only take communion once a year in the Amish community. They take it once a year, and they only take it after everyone has forgiven everyone else. Even if it takes a week of services, they will not share in communion until everyone has forgiven everyone else. And you don't get to get mad and go to the next church. If you work out, if you are angry with someone in the community, you have to work it out in that community. You don't get to get in your buggy and go to the next town to go to the church there which is a good practice, I think, to make people deal with each other in a very healthy way. So what they do is they forgive, but they don't necessarily reconcile. You can forgive someone without reconciling. You can forgive them. You can let go of the anger. You can let go of, of your right to revenge or feelings of hatred towards someone else. You can let all that go, but you don't have to necessarily be together in the same way you were before. We need to learn from folks who have practiced forgiveness better than we have in our culture and in our communities. We can do this if we try. Because we have to learn to be peacemakers. What we say in the call to worship, it was a rephrase of what you usually hear, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. Sometimes God's children don't get along better than our own children do. We're called to love one another in a way that is profound, in a way that lets God work in our hearts and in our lives so that we too might be makers of peace, starting in our families and then moving into the community. Bill Brown, when I talked to him about preaching next week, said, thanks a lot, because I told him we were talking about peace, and I said, and guess what week you get? Peace within the church. He said, thanks a lot. Because you know churches have difficulty getting along, sometimes over the color of the carpet, sometimes over matters of doctrine. Sometimes churches are on the verge of schism like the United Methodist Church is right now. But if we can, with our own families, practice making peace, we'll be better at it in the world. So I hope you will maybe go home and turn on a Christmas carol and watch Ebenezer Scrooge, what happens to him through the power of his father's negativity, how broken he is. But then look at the power of God's redemptive love poured into him and what happens there. Because we have the ability to change. No matter how broken things are, God is in the business of restoration and healing and hope. And God is the God of peace. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So in his name, we will make peace with one another. So 
right now what I want you to do is take a moment before we get into communion this morning. Um, and we're going to sing communion this morning. I hope, I hope you remember this. And I'm going to croak it out because I'm having a little vocal cord atrophy, it seems like, right now is what's happening with my voice. We're going to sing responsibly, and then we're going to sing together some familiar Christmas tunes to the prayers of communion. But before that, I want you to take a few moments now in silence. I want you to think about the people who have hurt you, people you were at odds with, the people you fought with, whether they're in your family or in your community of, around you. And I want you to take a few minutes and ask God to let you love that person. Because you love God, I know you love God, I see it in your face, I see it in your actions, I hear it in your voices and in the work that you do and the proclamations you make. But I want you to look at that person and say, as much as I am angry at you or as much as I'm hurt by you, that's what I really think of Jesus Christ, my Savior. Let that be the catalyst that moves you toward accepting someone else, which begins with accepting yourself. So I invite you to spend a few moments in prayer before we move into our communion liturgy.